Hi, everybody. It's Mary Roback from the Canadian Urban Institute. Thanks for joining us. And thanks for being such a stalwart audience and taking breaks periodically so that you can get a uh, to see some of these images that are being uh, shared across the country around in uh, specific kinds of initiatives that communities are doing to bring their their uh, downtowns back. So we're appreciative of that. Um, this is a, the second part of our session on bringing back. One of the important things is we, we talked about housing just now. Now we're going to talk about literally bringing people back on transit. So I appreciate that we have a a cast of uh, interesting folks to help inform this. I am conscious that we are doing back-to-back -back mantles, just saying, and uh, uh, I know that there will be people that will be very concerned about this. We, uh, we did our best, I think, to try to create a kind of diverse program across the two days. But as it turns out, uh, transit is a, uh, just saying, a male-dominated uh, discipline. And uh, maybe that's part of the dilemma we are faced with now is that uh, we need to think carefully about that. We need to think about the gender distribution of this, because I bet you, I almost guarantee most transit riders, probably a higher proportion are women, just saying, or, um, or just not men, shall I say. And, um, uh, but the other thing is that uh, we uh, continue to try to find ways to have more diverse voices in all of these sessions. So uh, encourage people to participate in the chat and people are asking in the chat, what's happening to all this stuff. So at the end of each day, we're gonna try to sort of extract, we've got people listening on all the sessions to see if we can start to shape up what a kind of agenda for action will look like and where we need more research, where we're gonna need more inquiry through this year and how do we actually you know, fine tune what our expectations are of the different orders of government and, and each other. You heard in the housing session, people are saying, well, it's not actually just government. It's gonna take a lot of different actions by different sectors. So, um, so we're in the process of aggregating that. If you wanna stay engaged with us, here we are, like just uh, send a note to me or to anybody on the CUI team if you wanna stay involved with us to help us hone this because it ain't gonna be fixed in two days of sessions on a summit. It's gonna be a steady, steady effort as we build a new urban agenda. So I hope people will stay with us for these two days and then stay with us beyond that because it, uh, this is just, as we always say, it's not the end of the conversation, it's just the beginning. So um, again, please know that we put things into the chat and we publish the chat afterwards. So by all means, have at it, put in your ideas there, questions, Marcy, uh, Birchfield is going to moderate this session. She's from the Economic Blueprint Institute at the Board of Trade in Toronto and knows this uh, topic uh, inside and out, back and forth, and knows the interconnections that exist in terms of why transit is so important to the recovery of a downtown. So Marcy, thanks for joining us, and I'll turn you over to your mantle, and, uh, uh, and then there'll be lots of engagement, I'm sure, from the crowd uh, to have some conversation about the role of transit. So thanks for joining us, and we look forward to listening. Great. Thank you, Mary. And uh, th I want to thank the CUI for raising this important issue. I think research that we've done at the Toronto Region Board of Trade just on the Toronto downtown uh, area has shown that if you look at economic districts across our broader region, that the downtown has by far been hit, been hit the hardest. The businesses and the workers downtown have been hit the hardest, while 63% of them could pivot back to pivot to work, work, work from home. Um, you, essentially, you had about over 20,000 businesses who rely on those daytime workers uh, to, to be their daytime customers and their nighttime customers as well. So huge impact to, to our downtowns right across Canada um, as, 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 as we all work, as many of us work from home, all the panelists here, it looks like to me, are working from home. Uh, but I'd like to start by introducing um, our, our four panelists um, who are representative uh, from across Canada. Um, I'm going to start uh, by introducing just shortly who they all are um, and then give you a, a little bit of, an, of, of a taste of what we're, what we're hoping to do is really to set up uh, what is the problem. You know, as I, as I stated to the panelists, what's the dire straits of urban transit these days? Um, so uh, we'll hear from Calgary and we'll hear from Windsor in terms of level setting and what it looks like for them and uh, from two of our panelists uh, from, a, from a nationwide kind of perspective and, and their experience. And then it's looking at really how are we going to get to solutions? So what are the solutions to get beyond, uh, you know, the problems that we're facing in tr with transit? What are some innovative solutions that, that cities are looking at? Um, and then what support do we need from other levels of government uh, to really recoup uh, the transit ridership back to uh, to uh, to our downtowns, um, and 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 I think the other the other fair question that Mary raised is what are the expectations from other stakeholders? You know, what are the what are the expectations from the business community and the and the leadership that they need to show, uh, as well as uh, civic uh, you know civic society as well. So I will start by introducing our panelists. Um, we have Jason Rayner, who is the CEO of. Uh, of the city of Windsor, uh, formerly of the city city of Innisfil, or town of Innisfil, I should say. Uh, then we have Doug Morgan, uh, general manager of transportation at the city of uh, of Calgary. 
Uh, we also have David Cooper, who is the principal of Leading Mobility, uh, does, does, does a lot of work across Canada and with CUTA in particular, the Canadian Urban Transit Association. And last but not least, uh, uh, um, Bruce McGregor, who is the vice president, senior vice president, I should say, of the Canada, of Canada Transportation Business Line leader at ACOM, uh, and formerly of uh, lots of experience with Metrolinks here in the in the Toronto region. So, welcome to our panelists, and I really look forward to this discussion. And uh, maybe we can kick it off with Jason to set the stage of of uh, the impacts of urban transit, in particular in downtown. Um, some implications for downtown for the city of Windsor. Great, thanks very much, Marcy. Can you hear me okay? Great. Uh, yeah, just delighted to be joining uh, you from uh, the, the sunny south, uh, one of the most southern uh, regions in Canada. Just delightful here. Okay, there's a little bit of snow, I'll be honest, uh, but uh, generally very nice. Uh, same latitude as uh, Northern California, just just gorgeous spot. Uh, thanks very much to CUI and, and to my panelists for, for, uh, for coming today and, and participating. And I'll apologize in advance. I think I'm the only one on the panel who's not actually a transit expert. Uh, uh, Mary twisted my arm uh, to participate. And I think partly because, you know, as city manager, our role is to take the sort of the political direction uh, with the execution uh, challenges. And man, do we have a lot of execution challenges right now, transit. So uh, I'm, I'm here to learn perhaps more than uh, share insights. But uh, just to set the table a little bit, you know, uh, the city of Windsor, which has a population of about 235,000, uh, regionally about a half a million. Um, our ridership dropped in 2019 from 8.4 million uh, to about 2.5 million in 2021 annually. Uh, in 2022, we're projecting a return of 60% of the 2019 levels or about 5 million riders. Uh, but, you know, we're literally holding our breath uh, to see what happens, both to stop ourselves from getting COVID, but also just, you know, uh, trying to figure out what's really going to happen here. You know, university college students, of course, make uh, up a, a good chunk of our, our participants, our riders, uh, and waiting to see what happens there with, uh, you know, online learning working well, but also getting people back in person, of course. Uh, on the capital side, you know, everybody knows uh, the burden for reinvestment or investment you know, projected over the coming years for transit is crushing. It's hundreds of millions of dollars, even for a mid-sized city like ours. Uh, and this is particularly as we try to shift to electric, uh, you know, buses, which are typically more expensive on the front end, save on the, on the longer end. But then you need facilities that can charge these, these buses, right? So that we've got big retrofits that are required for our facilities and our inf that infrastructure. Um, and so, you know, we're trying to take all of those, you know, challenges from a fiscal perspective and then build a burning platform for uh, upgrades, investment, and, and even things like data, you know, we're, we're, we, we need to better, we need to gather uh, better data. We, we're still figuring out how to use that analytics uh, and to gather that data. And, you know, I'm a bit biased, obviously. I come from a background where uh, we introduced the first global, uh, you know, public transit system based on entirely on ride sharing because of the size of the community and so the demographics and the geography. So I, I have got a bit of a bias towards, you know, ride sharing, being able to support uh, what it what it looks like, not just first mile, last mile, but actually, you know, digging deeply into the data to find out where we can scale transit to really meet the needs of the community. Um, so for us in Windsor, you know, and I think maybe even more broadly, there's two fundamental questions uh, that I'm just delighted to talk to people more about. One is how do we create the user experience that attracts riders who will choose our service over using their own vehicles? You know, we're the, we used to be the automotive Canada, uh, capital of Canada. We're now the automobility capital of Canada. And so cars are really, really common and, you know, sort of uh, first position, I would say uh, here, but uh, really want people to help them make the right choice uh, to move to active transportation, multimodal and, and uh, also our transit system. Uh, that will allow us the economies of scale, I think, to really deliver the system that, that the community deserves. Um, and then secondly, you know, how do we appropriately scale those options? As I said, you know, what beyond the traditional transit piece, the on-demand, multimodal, those pieces, how do we integrate those really, really well? So uh, I hope that helps just to kind of set the stage from uh, at least one mid-sized city uh, and looking forward to the panel. Thanks, Marcy. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jason. And Doug, I'm going to pass it over to you to find out uh, a little bit more about issues in Calgary. Sure, I'd like to brag about the weather as well. It's one degree with a Chinook, so at least it's not freezing cold on the prairies. So 
Uh, maybe to start with uh, kind of the, the core of the discussion today, the downtown, and maybe Calgary's in a bit of a different predicament than others across Canada, where even if everybody came back to work, we have a 33% uh, vacancy rate in our downtown. So we not only have a COVID challenge, we also have a downtown and business occupancy challenge. And a lot of folks call it a problem, but I'm actually thinking of it more as an opportunity. It's an opportunity with a bit of a, uh, an opening and a, and a cleaner slate to really rethink what our downtown is. And forever it's been uh, the oil sector, the AM commute, the PM commute. And we've actually created a business unit within the city to focus solely on revisioning our downtown. And that's really focused on it being more than just the place to go to work and come home from. And that their tagline, which I love, it's it's moved from vacancy to vibrancy. And, and so th that's the critical thing for us. And then when I was thinking about chatting with you folks today and, and, and trying to measure our success by, by key metrics, when, when I thought about ridership, I'm wondering if that's really not the measure for us. It's really how do we get Canada and our cities back together to connecting and being social? And all we are as transit uh, operators is the vehicle to do that. And we're very much and very geared towards coming together. And we've seen the impact on our business during COVID, how impactful that could be. So when I look at um, the, the route ahead and how we actually are going to be successful, it's, it's really, uh, first of all, welcoming folks back. There's a lot of fear out there. How do we really uh, make them feel comfortable re-entering onto the mode of transit how do we almost treat it like a new product? We need to clean it up. There's some social disorder uh, issues uh, with a lot of the riders coming away. So how do we have that clean slate and welcome them back? Uh, number two is really lower those barriers to trying the service. So this may be new for them. How do we get them back trying it out? Some really aggressive marketing, uh, remind them why they left and really drive that value proposition of transit. Uh, number three, um, it's really not forgetting what makes transit successful. That's about frequency, that's about reliability and directness. And we can get distracted by the other things like, like mobile ticketing and, and traveler information. If at the core is a, a trip that's quick, reliable and direct. And, and finally, going back and tying it back to the downtown is to be part of that downtown experience. And we're lucky to, to be able to, to lead with a mode that doesn't bring uh, a car and the environmental impact to the downtown that doesn't have space for it. So if we can be more successful in supporting our downtowns, that means more space for the public realm, more space for people. Because I, I like to call us, we're, we're the greatest delivery mechanism of loads of pedestrians. That's our role. We really uh, do that. And it allows us then not to have a focus on parking and street mobility that we really allow that to happen. So when we look at Calgary's success, um, it's rebuilding that bound downtown, the experience, and then driving um, that to be the magnet for people to get there on a really uh, sensitive mode that's sensitive to the environment and to the space that, that we have in the downtown. Great, thanks, Doug. Thanks. Uh, I know Calgary has has definitely has a, a, some different challenges than other other downtowns. Uh, but as you, I love the opportunity. What is the opportunity to revision uh, uh, what what downtown downtown Calgary could be? So, David, I'd like to hear uh, some of your perspective from across Canada. I know the the report that you worked on with CUDA probably gives us some signs of what other cities are experiencing uh, uh, through through COVID. Marcy, thank you for uh, the question, and, and I appreciate Mary's uh, invite to the panel, and I get to sit in the panel with Doug, my old boss, so uh, I'm going to have some fun with that too. But um, CUDA last year worked with the transit agency to create a national recovery strategy to really help paint the picture on the operating funds shortfalls from the loss of ridership and the loss of revenue for public transit and to really maintain service. And one of the things of the conversations with downtowns is that we lost one ridership market, we lost our office workers, but there's actually a lot of people who still relied on transit through the pandemic and they're still relying on transit today. And they relied on transit before the pandemic. So I'm actually gonna take a little bit of a different lens, which actually bridges from the introductory comments from Mary that I really appreciated is that one of the things that was very evident from the pandemic is, you know, we had essential workers that relied on transit, but one very vital group of our society relied on transit was women. 
And after the recovery strategy, I got to work on a project with the University of Alberta and the Polytechnique of Montreal. And we did the first study in Canada on women's travel patterns on transit and how agencies are responding to this. We're actually releasing this report next week. And it was funded by Infrastructure Canada. And my role on this was to really take the deep dive behind the scenes on the transit agency and our policy responses and our budgetary responses and how we prioritize this. And women play a huge role in bringing transit back, but also ridership. Like the majority of riders on public transit are women. So for instance, the Toronto Transit Commission, 57% of riders are women. Uh, women travel on transit more during the off-peak and middays. We have such a peak-oriented service, largely because of our, our downtowns and, and uh, other types of employment uses. But we have this opportunity to redistribute service, which actually would make transit better for everyone, not just downtown, but just across our cities. And we're seeing that in, in the uplift of ridership in some of our more suburban areas and some of our more our mostly ethnic communities. Um, women trip chain more, and that's because of uh, opportunities and roles in the house in terms of employment, in terms of family formation, in terms of, 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 of caregiving and support. Women take more localized and short distance trips that we found through our study. And women also take more frequent trips on transit. So how do we uh, create fair uh, products and, and, and services that really tailor to that? And I think that is a huge conversation of, of how we need to look of how we bring transit back and, and a huge opportunity ahead of us. Great, thanks, David. Um, interesting uh, around uh, you know the, what transit, who transit serves essentially, and uh, I'm, I'm assuming that some of the uh, some of that work also looked at you know who who can who can afford to you know to to drive and and who who the service impacts are, are essentially um, also impacting as well. So, Bruce, over to you. Great, thanks, Marcy, and uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, this is a really critical conversation, and uh, I'm going to take it from a perspective of, you know, ACOM having uh, obviously a presence in many of the communities in Canada, doing work for many of the agencies that are delivering transit, but also has a window and providing uh, services to other North American and European and Asian uh, communities as well. And what are we seeing and hearing from some of my colleagues and clients internationally? And first of all, uh, I, would, I would remind everybody, we still have a congestion problem. Uh, you know, it's still there. Uh, we see it every day. It hasn't gone away. And uh, in fact, uh, in some ways, the congestion challenge is exasperated because some of our most vulnerable communities are diverse communities that people rely on for frontline services, uh, more of a gender based uh, bias that these are where some of the worst congestion is occurring and the challenges in terms of serving those populations. So in my mind, the conversation has to be, and we're seeing in virtually all of our, our communities that we're working in, it's about access and it's about equity and making sure that uh, the people who have the service are still receiving that service. We also have to remember that this is about reducing the environmental impact of transportation. And uh, we need to have that decarbonization agenda out in front of us and uh, make sure that we you know, is, is there may be a tendency for people to think, oh, I can get in the car again, uh, that know that there are some really significant considerations and impacts that we need to be thinking about individually and as a community. Uh, this is an opportunity really to, to drive forward. Uh, I think I heard something along the lines of optimizing the kinds of services and uh, routes and uh, capacity that we're providing to different parts of, of, the, uh, of the cities that we live in to make sure that those who are most vulnerable are getting services. Uh, this is also an opportunity in many of the largest urban areas where sometimes there can be fragmentation of services to have a uh, to step back and think about how can we come up with a more integrated approach among public agencies in the delivery of services as we think about providing a better uh, uh, value opportunity to our customer base as we come uh, through this COVID environment. And also think, about mobility as a service and other transportation service providers and how we can integrate with them as well, since they can serve first and last miles in a lot of ways that are quite complementary to some of the public services that uh, uh, we're all familiar with. And lastly, uh, the use of data. And um, we've been developing and applying in places like New Jersey, uh, a system called Mobilitics, which is really how are people using the system differently how can we use the massive information and data that we have available to ourselves to make better decisions? 
so that we can provide real-time information to our customer base and we can help uh, the, the owners of the services uh, uh, come up with those optimized strategies that meets the needs of the customer base. Great, thank you for all, all four panelists uh, for those opening remarks. And uh, and I think we, we heard some some getting at some of the solutions um, and some of the impacts and who who's being impacted. Um, I wonder if one of the things that we can we can speak to is you know there's there there's a real concern I know from transit agencies that if we lose uh, that uh, that um, that ridership, if people choose another mode, if people are you know going to their cars. That there's it's a it's a real difficulty of getting them back to transit, and I wonder if if we can if each of you can speak to some of the creative ways. You know, I think uh, Doug, you mentioned some marketing. I know here uh, in the Toronto region, both the TTC and uh, Metrolinks are looking at you know marketing just the safety that you know that the types of filtration systems that we're we're using to keep uh, transit safe here. Um, you know, leadership leaders are using transit, um, uh, and and. And I think the other piece that, that has been really interesting from Metrolink's point of view is that they've been trying to attract riders on the weekend, uh, particularly in the summer, you know, looking at uh, looking at getting people back onto transit for different purposes other than the work trip. So I wonder if each one of you can speak a little bit and maybe I'll maybe I'll start with Doug since you opened up uh, some of those uh, some of those. Uh, sure, that's a it's a great question. I go back to my initial comments, uh, making sure of the heart of the service offering is competitive, it be, that it's direct, it's reliable, and, and, it, and it's uh, frequent. So if you've, if you've um, got that nut cracked, um, there's other things that we can do in order to just make sure we're keeping up with the experience of the citizen. And, and we had a, a trends workshop a few weeks ago where we talked about how important it is for that immediate interaction on value. And so things like on-demand service, things like mobile ticketing on your cell phone, where we really reduce those barriers. You don't need a whole bunch of knowledge to go and use the service. It's like your Amazon purchase. It's pretty easy to spend money and get it delivered to your door. How do we get that experience for transit? So we, we've tested on-demand for new service. We've te tested conversion. We've got mobile ticketing, uh, better uh, information for, for customers on on the uh, on the arrival times of their buses, so those are part of it. But then also key partnerships, so things like events and, and things we're all craving once COVID's done, uh, going to a summer festival, going to the the folk festival downtown. How do we partner and be part of that experience? And and really, what you're then is through those events introducing them to a way to use transit. So a little bit of a, a quote unquote gateway drug for them to come back to transit. To, to come to a, go to a Flames game or a, a football game. So to, to get part of that experience and then keep it playful and keep that experience of what it takes to ride transit uh, in their minds. And, and the final thing I'd say, we need to be more ready as agencies for more of the on-demand and the infrequent so that it no longer is, oh, eight o'clock, I'm gonna get on the bus, I'm gonna go to work, that, oh, it's raining today, I'm taking the bus. Oh, it's sunny today, I'm taking a, a bike. So how do we work with those other modes to work together to really drive the kind of mobility we want? So I think those are the key things I, I work on uh, to help us kind of keep up with what citizens are expecting from their transit systems. And I and I would I would suggest that even as we look at what are the long term effects of remote working from home and this kind of hybrid model that all day service you know the the creativity that transit service uh, operators can can inject in welcoming people all day um, I think is another piece that uh, that you know particularly for the downtown for people to get back on transit to come downtown that all day service is going to be really important. Um, Even some of the things like a monthly pass, does that make sense anymore? Does anybody use the service that way? Or is it, do you more, go more, just use it and we'll send you a bill at the end with, with a whole bunch of um, reductions because you, you've uh, used it um, more frequently, things like that, just being super flexible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jason, Jason would you like to interject there? 
Yeah, no, I mean, I think I agree with everything that Doug said. The experience part is is critical. The multimodal, you know, the ability. We had a we had an electric scooter pilot that was wildly successful uh, in Windsor this past year, this summer in particular. Uh, so how you integrate those systems, I think it makes a lot of sense. I'm also curious, you know, again, as a non-expert in the pricing strategy piece, you know, especially for mid-sized city, cities, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, the data would allow us to provide better subsidy directly to the people that need it, uh, that could allow a pricing point perhaps that would uh, not, you know, for those that are choosing to take the system as opposed to take their car, for example, you know, they may have the means, but they, you know, if the pricing was at a point where it created an experience that's different or allowed us to scale, right, which is our critical piece in Windsor, you know, uh, I'm really interested in how that could work, because I think we've sort of taken this approach that, you know, at least in Windsor, that it's a system of last resort, which is just, that's not how you build a world class uh, uh, city. Uh, and so, uh, but it has to be affordable, right? So there, I think there's really interesting financing models that have to get it engaged to, to, to unpack that, uh, which we're excited to do. Marcy, can I add something to, to this? I'm excited to hear about fares. One of the things I've been working on is fare policy for a couple of transit agencies. And fare policy is a very scary topic because fares is a significant portion of revenue. And to add different options to customers, there's a whole suite of benefits of doing that. But there's also implementation challenges with that. And also it changes the levers of revenue you have on other components. And a lot of agencies, to be blunt, have not push this forward as much as they should. Um, what I saw some very interesting data from the TTC in Toronto last month, the frequent trips or infrequent trips that customers are taking and the ways that they collect fares from those trips have actually almost recovered fully. The passes have been static and yeah. we don't know what the future of hybrid works going to be. And we don't have the flexibility of, of products yet. And I don't see a lot of movement from uh, at least on the public facing side of, of agencies really looking at very different dynamic fare products. One of the things that transit agencies do not do well at is collecting fares. Transit's great at moving people, but we make it extremely hard to actually collect fares and have those options. And that needs a rethink, I think, across the country. And I also wonder if this is the time to do that, right? Um, uh, many trans agencies are considering, you know, I, I, I know you said 60% for Windsor for 2022. And I think, you know, everyone's fingers crossed and maybe this will happen, maybe it won't happen. Um, but, you know, I've heard 2023, 2024, even if you look at the things like the, the uh, aviation industry, same thing, their, their, their full recovery is not true for years to come. And so this kind of moves us into our, our second part, the, the other part of the discussion, which is really about the supports that, that are needed. And is this the time to really understand who's riding transit, how you attract people to transit? What, is the, what, is, what are the sort of experimental fare policies that could be, uh, um, uh, you know, we can, we can look at um, uh, to really, to, as we ask, make the big ask, I think, for some of these, uh, you know, um, upper levels of government to, to, to help support some of these transit agencies. So maybe, Bruce, I can, I can ask you to, to speak to that a little bit around, uh, you know, what is, what is the opportunity here in terms of looking at uh, um, new ways of, of attracting people to transit, to using transit, while we're still, for, while we're still recovering our ridership? Sure. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll start with the, uh, the words data mining and, and, and information. And uh, we have so much information that we do not have the right tools, I believe, to actually extract, analyze, and then feed into our decision making. And uh, I think there's a real opportunity uh, for agencies, both public and private, to partner together in new ways to, to, uh, to get that information, share it, uh, and then use it for those choices. And we're starting to see that in some of our uh, applications south of the border that uh, communities, particularly in large metros where there may be multiple public transit agencies, there may be uh, multiple transportation service providers in the private sector, and how are they trying to bring their information together uh, so that they can make better choices. So I think data mining is one piece. The next word I'll use is flexibility. And uh, we've already talked about fair products, but this is, uh, I think, an excellent time to be experimenting and trying different kinds of fair products so that uh, we can test 
uh, how people respond given the kind of environment we're in. The third one that we're seeing a lot of is collaboration. And uh, particularly when we see collaboration uh, between public and private uh, entities uh, so that they can, uh, for example, provide a link trip uh, using multiple loads so that uh, you're paying once and they're, they're distributing the, the payment between those different providers. And the last the word I'll use is transparency that uh, you know, people want to see uh, that uh, these choices are being made in a very open, upfront, clear uh, and transparent fashion. So I would say data mining, flexibility, collaboration, transparency, I think those are the watchwords that are going to be driving success for the future for us. Other panelists on uh, this, this idea of flexibility and experimentation. What are what are what are some uh, ideas that that uh, we can bring to bear in terms of solutions and demonstrations of how municipalities uh, and how municipal transit agencies can actually be flexible um, and provide uh, you know more of this information to really understand what the investment is, uh, leveraging the investment that they're getting from upper levels of government. Yeah, maybe I could start. I think there's no shortage of data that transit agencies can provide. Um, so I think um, that, that's probably a good place to start, but but then also broadening our perspective on, it's gotta be about all mobility. And we talked a bit about partnering with micro mobility, um, looking at scooters and car share and, and really uh, pushing forward into that where we're, we're not just driving ridership on on buses and trains, but we're really trying to get people to travel differently. And I always say that the battle is the purchase of the car. If we can get them to put off the second car or or really not buy the first car, we can compete. But once they've sunk that cost and they've got the, that up there and it's in their pocket, it's really easy to use. So whatever we can do through our partnerships uh, with all mobility, I think that will really drive people to say, hey, I'm not so scared I can take transit or I'm going to jump on my bike and drive those health benefits, the environmental benefits, and, and really get them at the point of buying that car. Can I add a point to, to Doug's point? I think there's a huge leadership opportunity in the integrated mobility space for public transit. I have a number, in addition to my clients in the transit space, I actually have a number of micro mobility clients and technology clients as well. And what's happening in the micro mobility space on scooters and e-bikes is quite fascinating. Calgary Transit operates the scooter program in Calgary. I think that's huge. I don't think we talk about that enough in terms of understanding the role of transit and how they can actually manage and help shape these, these programs and their deployments. Windsor had a, a very successful program that was nationally talked about. We have very different policy regulations for micromobility all across Canada, and it's very segmented right now, which makes it very challenging for the private sector to actually integrate as part of your, your, your technology and sustainable transportation solutions, but also work with your agencies. And I think we need a, a broader conversation of how to level set this opportunity and, and place it as part of the transit offering in many ways uh, across, across the country to, to, to prevent people from, from buying that second car, that first car and buying those options because we need to evolve with uh, the sector. And, and right now it's, it's, very, it's a patchwork that has a huge opportunity to be part of the, the transit family. Yeah, I'm, also, I'm also interested in, you know, the the pilot, you know, exploring this pilot concept a little more and the prototyping, you know, I think uh, Bruce maybe mentioned in others that, you know, this maybe is the time and you can get away with, I think, a little bit uh, of experimentation. And, and, you know, I'd be interested to know what people think about, you know, uh, so let me use the private sector kind of analogy, right? If if someone's experimenting and deciding whether a private sector company is to get into a market, the, the the sort of last thing that they'll necessarily be looking at is the price, right? If you think of Netflix introduction, you know, that started at what, $6.99, you know, they would never have survived if they didn't up their price eventually. We all knew that was going to happen. But they also wouldn't have survived if they didn't spend billions of dollars on content to keep people as part of the experience, you know, participating in it, right? So I'm curious if there are examples or you know, where, where we've tried something, you know, to scale to the point where it actually provides that kind of user experience that people really enjoy. And then you sort of, you know, work backwards and over a period of time, you know, make the, the finances work. I mean, that sounds silly, but uh, I, I'm just curious if people have thoughts on that. Bruce? 
Well, I think that's a, a, a fantastic suggestion. I think it's one that we're all very familiar with as well. Uh, I think most of our organizations that we work with or have worked with in the past have looked at scale of pilots and moving them up as you get, as you learn and you succeed is, is something that uh, is something that, uh, you know, incremental success is something that most Canadians are very well versed in. You know, it's, 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 it's the way we do business in a sense in Canada. So I think that's something that we can use and uh, exploit uh, that, uh, that willingness, I think. Um, you know, the key piece to coming up with pilot projects in my mind is uh, having an, an appreciation for what you're trying to test and, uh, and uh, achieve, and then having an effective way to measure and be able to review of how well it's worked. So, uh, you know, there's, I think we were tried and true and we've got lots of experience in this country on how to go about doing that. And, uh, you know, whether it's a fair product, uh, whether it's a service offering, whether it's an integration, just small scale, uh, you know, I know that Metrolinx and uh, uh, some uh, transportation service providers have looked at how they can have the TSP provide that, uh, that trip into a GO station. Uh, as opposed to having someone drive to a go station, park the car for the day. Uh, but you can continue to apply that kind of example in many different situations. And uh, I, I think there, this is a great time to be, to be testing those kinds of solutions. Yeah, we, we only have about uh, six minutes le left. It looks like six or seven minutes left. And I, and I want to get to this question um, by, uh, by one of the um, attendees around if, is there a specific FCM or big FCM uh, Federation of Canadian Municipalities or big city mayors uh, uh, caucus asked to the feds retransit? If so, what is it? And I think it really links to the couple of things that we're hearing is, you know, if if the objective of a transit operator is to recoup fares for you know for revenues, that's that goes against essentially what a lot of the, a lot of what we're talking about in terms of partnerships with mobility services, partnerships with uh, you know with sort of the first and last mile kind of modes. Um, so so I, I wonder if I can if I can ask each of the panelists to 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 weigh in on that is if there's the big big ask, what is that big ask to the feds? And I guess to to the to to a certain degree to the provinces as well. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll start off just a, a macro perspective. Transit capital is has been decently funded and in, into an increasing amount for years, and and the capital funding has been rather intact, which has been absolutely awesome. The government still sees the value of that investment. In terms of FCM, uh, SCM has a huge role, and the big city mayors have a huge role in this conversation. Of right now, we have a housing crisis across Canada. If the continued uh, operating support does not continue, we will have a transit crisis. Yeah. Buses will be parked. People will not. People will be left behind, and especially the most vulnerable, and also community members such as women will be left behind. We will have a transit crisis, and it's. I don't see any which way around it. The. Uh, I'll give an example. I'm doing some work in Edmonton right now for uh, looking at uh, the impact of COVID uh, on operating budgets and 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 how how we can kind of deal with service growth and, and management and. Safe restart covered half the loss of fares. If you lost that funding, you you will have significant uh, limitations in your ability to provide service. Doug, if you were to ask the if you you, you were to be part of the the ask to the federal government, what would you ask? Sure, maybe just a little bit of backstory. I, th I think the federal government has been very helpful with some of the funding already for the operating backstops. And I think uh, both FCM and the Canadian Urban Transit Association have, have done uh, yeoman work in order to get the attention of both the federal and the provincial governments to come to our aid. But now is the time, I think, to make sure we can protect the recovery. And the last thing I wanna do is to be trailing the recovery with service. If we want labor mobility, we want people coming back, we better have sparkling stations and great service to start. So we really, the compelling um, ask for them is fill the gap right now. We really need it and we're optimistic we can, we, can, we can get there. The last thing we wanna do is for people to walk into a dirty station where the bus never comes. So that would be the first ask. The second is to continue with, with that long-term commitment. Uh, someone mentioned Netflix and that investment in their catalog. Those things in transit are rapid transit networks. We have an LRT investment, the BRT. 
that's our long-term strategy to make those investments. So I'd say in the short term, fill the gap in the long term, make sure we can rely on that funding and we can build these long-term projects. Bruce, is there a provincial ask? You know, the province regulates, you know, sets the rules of the game for many of these, uh, for many of the transit operators. Is there, is there a provincial ask? Well, I think the provincial ask to some, in some respects, mirrors a lot of the, the federal ask. I think it's for sustainability of support uh, so that those considerations of equity and access can be achieved. Uh, that, uh, you know, women are, lot, are not uh, uh, found themselves losing services, low-income communities are not finding themselves losing services. I think that's really important. Uh, I think the decarbonization push is something else that can be sustained and achieves multiple objectives at provincial, territorial, and the federal level. Uh, and, and building for the future. Like I know there has been a lot of money that's gone into large capital, but it's important because those are the building blocks, the, the skeleton really of the, the system that we need in the future. For the provincial governments and perhaps maybe a role for the federal government as well, it's a focus on innovation. How can they incent uh, mm -hmm. the, the local community to take a risk, to try something different, uh, to report on those results, see if they can use that to leverage something uh, new and different and uh, important to the community. So I think uh, some kind of an innovative uh, approach to uh, small pilots, tests, uh, that can then have a focus on scale and growth of what works the best. Great, great. And uh, Jason, do you Jason, do you want to uh, add to the Yeah, just highlight uh, and underscore what Bruce said. You know, we've seen examples, uh, at least in Ontario, where the government has said, look, we're going to give you some money, but you actually have to use it to try something different. Uh, and you got to share the story and the success or the failure with others so they can learn. And it's hugely powerful, right? Because there's the needs are so tremendous on transit and others. We're, we're loath to take the risks, you know, because we know the direct result, you know, of injection into operating our capital is, is sort of our bread and butter, but being forced, you know, in one sense to actually to make that innovation, to do that prototyping, I think it's just critical. Uh, it's a really good point. Well, I, I want to thank all of the panelists. I know where I'm going to be yanked off the stage uh, in, in, uh, in, in a minute or so uh, and, and passing it over to, to Mary. But I, I do want to thank all the panelists for their great perspectives and, uh, and ideas and, and contributions to, uh, to the big ask for the, the, the federal government. And, uh, and, and as I say, I think provincial governments as well, we need it. We, as part of this, this playbook should be about how the provinces also have a role to play um, in the recovery of our, of our downtowns and our transit systems. Thanks, gang. I mean, you know, you really, we really do have an opportunity to come out of the gate stronger, right? And uh, I think the dilemma is that, I mean, I live on a transit route. I see a streetcar that's empty uh, every, every moment I'm out. And it just astonishes me that we have managed, I mean, this is a story that I hope will get told, that we did still manage. Uh, Jason, I appreciate your experience slightly different in Windsor, but in, in the larger cities, they still did manage to keep their systems going, even with drastically reduced ridership. And they had to repurpose them in some cases because we didn't take as many people from the periphery into the downtown. Suddenly you had to refocus and say, how do I get essential workers to their jobs? So mm -hmm. it's given us an, an opportunity to rethink that, whether or not the way we had the system organized with so many folks coming into the downtown in, in, those, in, in those sort of peak periods you know, are we going to move now, as you suggested, Marcy, to more 24 kind of, not 24 seven, but just more regular kinds of commuting patterns that won't necessarily be confined to just two hours in the morning and two hours in the evening. So honestly, thanks so much, gang, for joining us on this and also amazing, raising the last mile issue and raising the idea of can we integrate these systems so that we have other options. Um, I love the person in the chat who's got, who's paying kids to actually clean the bus stop for her so that uh, from leaves and snow, thanks, that's a good way to do it and uh, we have sometimes we have to just do informal informal fixes right uh, we've been a big global pilot of the diy city through COVID, so i appreciate people suggesting that and i'm looking forward to a really vigorous conversation in 2022 about how do we sustainably fund transit systems it's good for climate it's good for all the reasons we all know but how what is the financial model going forward and people like bruce who've been at it for a long time you know bruce we've got to convince our colleagues 
in the provincial and federal governments that there probably needs to be a different kind of formula, right? And that we're going to have to have some kind of imaginative way of rethinking the business model of transit. If we, we're one of the only countries in the world that doesn't actually directly fund from income tax collected federally uh, transit system. So we have to think carefully about that and what that's going to be. So I'm looking forward to having all you guys, uh, gals and gal, um, engaged in this conversation as we, as we go forward. So Bruce, thanks so much, Jason, David, and Doug. Tremendous to have you. Great to have Marcy. She's on the COI board. Thanks to CUDA, who helped us pull the session together, and Shiv's in the chat. It's been tremendous having you. Thanks, guys. I really look forward to an ongoing conversation. We're taking a break. 14 minutes. Watch some videos, listen to some music. We'll see you back here at 4 o'clock Eastern, 1 o'clock Pacific. And we're going to specifically talk about anchor institutions and their role in bringing back downtowns. First up, faith places. Second up, libraries. See you in 14 minutes. Thanks, everybody.